Good morning, everybody. Let's stand as we get ready to worship the Lord. Psalm 106 says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. And our prayer is, remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them. Lord, we call out to you and we pray for your favor. We pray, Lord God, for the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit as we declare your greatness, Lord. We are here for you, Jesus. We lift up your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's clap our hands and give the Lord praise today. Yes. Amen. And I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. And the man's empty praise and the treasures that fade are never enough when you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied done no matter what we've been through and he takes us broken as we are and Lord, he makes us into something beautiful in his eyes right let's uh, think about that as we continue to worship him let's sing it out church as you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes Turn shame into glory, cause you're the only one who can. You turn praise into garden, you turn bones into army, you turn seas into highways, cause you're the only one who can. Turn praise into God. You turn both into army. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. No, nothing is better than it was. No, there's nothing better than you. No, there's nothing better than you. No, there's nothing. And nothing is better than it is. turning You turn crazy into God. 
seated for just a minute. Selah has our scripture reading for today. I'm reading from Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do in the word of deed, do everything in the, in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen. Let's stand on this worship. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step. 
breath I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. The ways of mercy, ways of grace. Everywhere I look, I see you. Your love has captured me. Oh my God, this love I can't be. Every move I make, I make in you. You make me lose Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every breath I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Seat it. I love the na 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 nas. Matthew chapter 26, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And he said to them, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. If you uh, didn't grab the cup and the bread, uh, you can get up now and go to the foyer and grab, uh, grab one. We'll, we'll wait for just a minute. Uh, but the Lord Jesus, he created a covenant, and the covenant was created by his blood. He shed his blood. That was the price for us to receive forgiveness. That was the price for us to be healed. That's the price for us to be able to have an eternal home, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the Lord set up a sacrificial system that just was a picture of what Jesus was going to fulfill. A lot of times people say in the Old Testament, you see a God of judgment, you got a God of law. But you see grace, you see grace, and you see mercy in the Old Testament. And the Lord, when he describes himself, he says that he is a God of mercy, that he is a God that forgets. He is a God that wants to forgive. He is a God that is good. And so we see in the Lord Jesus Christ his goodness when he went to the cross to pay the price that wasn't his to pay. It was ours. It was our sin debt. And so the Bible says that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, that they would not perish, but they would have everlasting life. And that's what we're here to celebrate today. Lord Jesus, we take this bread and we know that it represents your body that was given as a sacrifice for all, for all eternity. And so Lord Jesus, we do eat this in remembrance of you. And Lord, we recognize that this cup represents your blood that was shed. Lord, you were bruised, you were beaten. Lord, you were not just murdered, but Lord, you were abused. We know that you love us so much 
that you endured the cross. And so, Lord, we pledge to live for you. And we drink this in remembrance of you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I've traveled on And there was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found And I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now And there was Jesus In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces And every minute, every moment of Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it And there was Jesus This man who needs amazing kind of grace Forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay And I'm not perfect so I thank God every day And there was Jesus Would you stand and sing with us? In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing up the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you that you never leave us. You never forsake us. Lord, that is why we love you and we follow you and we serve you. Be exalted, Lord. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see the truth you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree, will you say amen? Amen. First Corinthians chapter 9, that's where we're going to be today. I uh, told you last week that we are going to have a focus on whatever it takes, whatever it takes to saturate our community with the gospel. Uh, after Labor Day, we're going to begin to, we're joining up with an uh, organization, it's actually a movement called Saturate. And the goal is to team up with Campus Crusade crew, uh, who, who are the ones who produced the Jesus film. How many of you have heard of the, of the Jesus film? I know you have. It's uh, translated into languages all over 
uh, this world. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put the Jesus film on the door as a gift um, to every one of our neighbors. Every one of our campuses are already doing this. Baldwin has already exceeded about 18,000 homes. And it's just our prayer that as we go out and we prayer walk and we saturate our community with the gospel, that the Lord will touch people's hearts and they'll find hope in the Lord Jesus. How many of you have found hope in Jesus? Amen. Amen. So whatever it takes, that's what we're going to talk about today. Whatever it takes. I told you last week that I was entering into a contest with the other pastors. We were going to have a rib cook-off. And I am proud to say, whatever it took to win, that's what I did. I got online, I looked at YouTube videos, one after another after another. I tried everything I could to figure out how to make the best ribs that I could possibly make. I did a practice run on Monday, and then when the day of the competition came on Wednesday, I was early, early in the morning looking at some other YouTube videos, and I saw this guy, his name is Heath Riles, and he uh, uh, has won 50 championships uh, making ribs, and there's one place in St. Louis that had his, uh, had his dry rub. It happened to be down the street from me. I waited for uh, the, the store to open. I ran down there, and I said, listen, I'm, I'm in a competition. I want to do whatever it takes to win. Will the Heath Riles do it? He says, oh, yeah, the Heath Riles will do it. So I had bought the Heath Riles, and I sprinkled, and then I sprinkled again, and I sprinkled again, and I, I did all this stuff. But here's what happened. I won. I won. <laughs> so if anybody wants some ribs, let me know. But I won. I, I, I had to do whatever it takes. You know, sometimes you get in that mentality, you want to do whatever it takes. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that's exactly what Paul says about sharing the gospel. He wants to do whatever it takes to share the gospel with people. In fact, at the very end of this passage, he says, Do you not know that in a race... All the runners run, but only one, only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. He's saying that we need to approach sharing the gospel with people like a runner approaches winning a race. We have to have such an attitude that we want to do whatever it takes to be able to share the gospel with people that are around us. Why? Because people matter to Jesus. People matter to the Lord Jesus, so they must matter to us. In, in Matthew chapter 9, you see this picture of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus was going throughout all the cities, all the villages. He's teaching in their synagogues. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing people's diseases and those who have affliction. But then it says this. It reveals the heart of our Lord Jesus. It says that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. I have to admit that sometimes when I'm driving around and I see the houses after houses and blocks after blocks and all the people, sometimes I have to stop and say, Lord, I need compassion like you have compassion. When the Lord looked over the city, he was moved in his heart with compassion. And when we are driving around and we view the people that are all around us, we as the Lord's people need to have compassion in our heart. And it says this. He says, when he saw the people that are living without him, he saw them as people who were harassed and helpless. He didn't just see them as lost. He saw them as people who were being harassed and they were helpless. The word helpless here literally means to be thrown down. So the Bible tells us that there is a world, there is a culture, and there is an enemy, Satan, who is harassing people. We are told that he is a murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning. He is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And what he does is he harasses people, and he throws them down. And Jesus says, the people are like sheep without a shepherd. Now, oftentimes when we think about the role of a shepherd with sheep, we think about the shepherd is leading them, and the shepherd is feeding them, and the shepherd is guiding them. That's an important role of a shepherd. But that's not the role that Jesus is talking about here. Because if a sheep is harassed by a predator, what does the shepherd do? He shoots the predator, right? <laughs> he takes out the enemy. And that's the role that he's talking about here. There are people out here that are harassed, helpless, and they need us to be able to fight for them because they can't fight for themselves. They need a shepherd, somebody who, do, who will be able to protect them. So then he goes on and he finishes by saying this, pray 
Pray that God will send out laborers. The remedy for people living without the gospel is, is for us to pray that Almighty God puts it on our hearts that we will be sent out, that the, that the Spirit sends us out. And that's, that's the attitude that Paul had. He had this whatever-it-takes attitude. He had this passion. He had this zeal. He had this fire. You could even call it an obsession. He had this obsession to win people for Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 16 of our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Do you see his heart? Don't give me some credit because I'm doing a good thing by preaching the gospel. He says, it is something that is an absolute necessity for me to do this. In fact, woe if I don't do this. It's a, com it's a compelling motivation in his heart. I have to tell people about Jesus, and that's where we need to get to be. As a church, we need to get to be there. We need to get to that place where, it's, where, where we're saying we have to share the gospel to people that are around us because nobody gets saved unless they hear the gospel. And the only way they're going to hear the gospel is if we share the gospel. I was reading a book uh, years ago, and it was a book written by a guy who was part of a major people movement in China, seeing millions of people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was giving a seminar because the techniques that he was using, and it's called T for T, Training for Trainers. And it's a fascinating book. It's about discipleship. And the methods he, were, he was using have been adopted by missionaries all over the world, in Indonesia and in India, all over the world. He was at a conference, and these missionaries came up to him and said, uh, we're not seeing anybody get saved at all. We're just not seeing it. And they left the conference, went back to their country, and then they came back a year later for a follow-up seminar, and they walked up to this this instructor, this leader who was teaching them and said, oh my gosh, in the last year we have seen people get saved. We have seen many people get saved. We'd been there for years and not seen anybody get saved. And now we're seeing people get saved. And the instructor asked them, what are you doing different? What's happening? What, what's the difference? And sheepishly, they said, we're sharing the gospel. <laughs> because before they weren't, they were just living in the culture. They were they were trying to be friends. They were trying to create relationships, but they would not share the gospel because they were afraid that they might get outed, that they might get caught, they might get thrown out of the country. And finally, they said they came to the realization, if we get thrown out of the country, what difference does it make? We're not winning anybody to Jesus anyway, so let's just share the gospel and let the Lord do what he wants to do with us. And people began to get saved. So it's so simple, but it's so true. The more we sow seed, the more more fruit we receive, right? We've got to share the gospel. And that's what Paul says here. Woe to me. Woe to me. He's, he's literally saying, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll pay any price. I will endure any cost. I will make any sacrifice to win someone to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you were lost, wouldn't you want somebody like that praying for you, trying to reach you? Amen. Six times in this passage, Paul talks about winning, winning others. Look at it. Verse 19, that I might win the more. Verse 20, that I might win Jews. Verse 20b, that I might win those who are under the law. Verse 21, that I might win those that are without the law. Verse 22, that I might win the weak. Verse 22 at the end, that I might by all means save some. So what is Paul teaching here? He's teaching what we call contextualization. To the Jews, I'm like the Jews. To the Gentiles, I'm like the Gentiles. I want to do anything that I can to contextualize the gospel so that I can reach people. Now, listen, the message does not change, but sometimes our methods have to change, right? Galatians chapter 1, it tells us the gospel does not change. In fact, Paul says, even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. The gospel does not change. You don't change the gospel. You don't wash it down. You don't water it. You don't, you don't uh, 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 push it aside. You, you contextualize it, though. That's what you do with this whatever-it-takes attitude. 
And that's the attitude we need to have. We need to have this attitude. Whatever it takes for us as a people, as a church, to reach people for Jesus, we need to do that. So Paul knew that he was going to achieve his passion, his desire, his goal of reaching people for Christ. He knew that if it was going to happen, he had to do a couple of things. And I want to point out to you what he's talking about here. If you want to have a whatever it takes attitude, here's the first thing you've got to be mindful of. I am willing to give up my preferences. Look at verse 20. He said, to the Jews, I become like a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. So Paul himself, we know he was a Jew, right? But he was not just an ordinary Jew. He was now a Christian Jew. He was what we would call a free Jew. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was no longer under the law. He was under love. He was under grace. He no longer had to have a legalistic relationship to God. He just needed to have a loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what Paul says. I'm willing to give up my rights, my preferences, in order to reach the Jews. The souls of men and women and boys and girls are more important than any rights that I might have. So we know that Jewish people are under legalism. They had to keep the law to be right with God. They had to submit themselves to all types of festivals and rituals and cleansing rituals. And Paul didn't have to do that anymore. He was free in Jesus. But this is what he says. It is more important for their souls to be saved than for me to exercise my rights and my privileges. So around the Jewish people, even though I don't have to, I'm going to live like the Jewish people. Paul was under liberty, but he's saying, I'm not going to, I'm not going to live in, in a way that's going to cause a, a barrier to share in the gospel with the Jews. So basically what he's saying, if they don't eat pork, I'm not going to eat pork. If they don't eat meat sacrificed to idols, I'm not going to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Several years ago, I was had Peter Kindergar here. Peter's from, you know, our pastor for Rock Church in, in, in Kenya. And he was here with us for about a year. And uh, I asked him, Peter, do you guys eat pork in Kenya? And he said, no, no, we don't eat, we don't eat pork. It's a dirty, it's considered a dirty animal. So nobody in his tribe or his area would eat pork. And I said, Peter, I'm going to show you why eating pork is a very good thing. So I drove him down to Pappy's. Anybody in here been to Pappy's? Drove him down to Pappy's, and he was unsure. We go in there. I was like, he wanted to get a sandwich. I'm like, no, we're not coming to Pappy's and getting a sandwich. We're going to get a rack of ribs, okay? So we got a rack of, of, of pork ribs. He pulled one of those ribs off, put it in his mouth, and he just goes, mmm. Last year when I was there, that happened like five, six years ago. Last year when I was there, we, we were talking about pork and pigs, and he was talking to the other pastors, and he said, that was the best thing that I have ever put in my mouth. <laughs> but we know that there are some people that don't eat pork. We know that some people have their own preferences. And when we're trying to share the gospel, we have to give up our preferences. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't particularly, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the biggest fan of goat. I mean, if I had a choice, goat wouldn't be my first uh, choice of meal. But when we go over to Kenya, we get out in the middle of nowhere, guess what's going to happen? They're going to serve you goat. In fact, one night I was so far out in the middle of nowhere. There was no lights. There's no electricity. We were dancing and singing. It was called, they call it a keisha, where they dance and sing and pray and give testimony. And it was so dark. And they finally sat everybody down and said, it's time for us to have our meal. And so they gave me a little bowl. And I'm out in Uganda somewhere, out outside of some town called Kapitoi. And I put my hand, there's no silverware, nothing like that. I put my hand into the bowl, and I knew I was going to have some goat. And I put it in my mouth, and the second it hit my mouth, I'm just like, ooh. I shine a flashlight in there, and I see intestines and stomach. I see the grass inside of the intestines that the goat just had before I had the goat. And I learn, lean over, I'm like, what is this? And the guy sitting next to me said, oh, pastor, they gave you the best parts. <laughs> the best parts. I'm like, okay. So I took another bite, and they said, do you like it? I said, you know what? It'd be selfish for me to eat the best parts all by myself. So I'm going to share the best parts with you guys, you know. 
But here's what Paul's saying. When I'm around the Jewish people for the sake of the gospel, I am contextualizing and I'm going to give up my personal preferences in order to create bridges so that I might be able to reach one to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to change the message. In fact, the message can be offensive to people. The gospel message can be offensive to people, right? And he tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But we don't change the gospel, but we do give up our preferences in order to reach people is what Paul is saying. Paul is building bridges and he's breaking down barriers. So that's the first thing. When we have a whatever it takes attitude, we're willing to give up our preferences. And here's the second thing. When we have a whatever it takes attitude, I am willing to give up my preferences, but also my privileges. I'm willing to give up my privileges. Look what he says in verse 21. To those who are without law, I live as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Jesus Christ that I might win those who are without law. So here's what Paul's saying. He would be like Jews when he's among the Jews, but he could also adapt and be like the Gentiles when he is among them. He could be as one, look what he says, without law. He's talking about in the ritual sense, in the ceremonial sense, not in the moral sense. He's not saying that you can live any way you want to live. He's not saying if you want sinners to hear you, you've got to sin with them. He's not saying that. He says, I live without the law, but I'm under the law of Christ. I'm still going to be obedient to Christ. I'm going to be obedient to what Christ wants me to do. But what he's talking here, he's talking about the Old Testament ceremonial law. When he ministered to Gentiles, he dropped all of those Jewish rituals and ceremonial traditions. And when he was with the Gentiles, he followed Gentile customs as long as it did not violate biblical principles. When Paul was in Jerusalem, he followed the Jewish religious customs. He observes the feasts and the fasts and the Sabbaths. But then when he's among the Gentiles, he could eat pork ribs, right? But when he was with the Jews, he would eat, eat only beef. So Peter, he's, he's saying this. He's saying, listen, I want to eliminate hindrances. I want to tear down walls. I want to remove barriers. I want to remove excuses. I want to be able to do this so I can preach and teach to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he says, verse 22. To the weak, I became as weak that I might, that I might win the weak. So who, who are the weak here? He's, he's referring to immature believers who really don't understand the liberty they have in Jesus Christ. For example... In the Jewish community, there are some new Christians that still wanted to observe the Sabbaths, that still wanted to go to the synagogues, that still wanted to follow the dietary laws, even though they didn't have to. But here's what Paul says, rather than push and create a barrier, what I'm going to do when I'm around the weak, I'll be as weak. And when I'm around the strong, I'll be as strong. Now, among the Gentiles, on the other hand, there were those who were saved out of idolatry, who didn't want to have anything to do with idolatry. So they would... They would be very sensitive. They're not going to eat any meat that was sacrificed to an, to an idol. And Paul, even though he knows that there's no idols, he knows that there's only one God. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's saying here, though, for those who are weak to have that sensitivities, I'm not going to just exercise my privilege in the face of them because here's the truth. Liberty, my personal liberty, is always limited by love. That's what Jesus teaches us. Our liberty is limited by our love. But I'm going to do whatever it takes to share the gospel. Now, for missionaries, uh, when missionaries first began to go out around the world, they began to go into other cultures and try to make their cultures be like an American church. The King James Bible. I did, you didn't know you had to learn English in order to have the real Bible, right? You all know the King James Bible didn't come from heaven, right? I'm making somebody mad, aren't I? The original Bible was in Greek, right? And then it was translated into the King James uh, uh, language. But people need to have the Bible in their language. All over the world, they need to have the Bible in their heart language. But the missionaries, they, they would go and they would teach these people how to have church. And they would try to make an African tribal church look just like a Baptist church in the middle of Georgia. And I've seen it. I've gone into these places. 
And then uh, you go out into the rural areas and you see the people worshiping in their own language, dancing and singing and jumping. In fact, whenever I send them a picture of our worship service, my friends that are over there, pastors say, Pastor, you need to teach your people how to jump. And I'm like, you need to come here and teach them how to jump, okay? <laughs> but they love to jump. In fact, there's a big controversy right now in some of the churches over there because there are some of the people that, that, that say we can jump and dance and sing, but then there's others that are influenced by American missionaries are saying, no, you can't jump. You just need to sing songs out of the hymnal, and you hear them in their language singing hymns that you and I know. And so that creates barriers. It creates this sense of, oh, do you have to become American in order to become Christian? And there are a lot of people that will say that Christianity, oh, that's a Western religion. It's not a Western religion. Christianity is at its root a Jewish religion. Christianity at its root is for every people, from every tongue, of every tribe, of every nation, because there is one name that is above every other name, and it's not an American name. It is a Jewish name. It is Jesus. His name is Jesus, and Jesus is Lord. And so we, we, we got to make sure that we don't create these barriers. We allow people to worship the Lord in their own heart language, in their own practices, John Kerry knew this. When John Kerry went to India, he believed that he had to immerse himself in the Indian culture. He had to be among the people, and he spent his whole life. He didn't see a lot of Indians come to faith during his lifetime, but what he did is he learned their heart language. He translated the Bible into their language, and as a result, there are millions of born-again Christians in India because of John Kerry. Now, there's two mistakes that people make when it comes to witnessing to other people. Here's the first one, Christian isolationism. That's a mistake. That's when you're growing up and people say, hey, don't go to the office party because somebody might be drinking wine there. Hey, don't go this place. Don't go to this place. Don't be around sinners. Don't go to parties. Don't socialize. You have to separate yourself. Christian isolationism. That's a mistake, though. That is not the practice of Jesus. Here's the second mistake, though. Christian compromise. That's a mistake also, where I compromise my faith, I compromise my morality, I compromise my witness because I become unchristlike. What's the alternative? All we have to do is look at Jesus, folks. Adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Now, we sing, we know that he is a friend of sinners, but when he was called a friend of sinners, it was pejorative. They weren't saying, oh, wow, Jesus is a friend of sinners. No, the religious leaders called him a friend of sinners as a slight. He, he's a, how, can he be, how can he be a rabbi? How can he be a holy man? How can he be from God? He is a friend of sinners. I love the story of Zacchaeus. I preach it all over the place when I'm doing the revivals out in Kenya and Uganda and, and other places because it's such a compelling story. You know the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man, right, that climbed up in a tree, and Jesus comes into the town, and here's Zacchaeus. He's reviled by his town. He's a tax collector. From the story, we know that he's corrupt, and when Jesus enters the town, he walks right up to Zacchaeus's tree, looks Zacchaeus right in the face, and he says, come down, for I'm going to your house today, right? Zacchaeus, a sinner, living far from God, but the Lord saw him, the Lord loved him, and guess what? Jesus even knew his name. He was on a first name basis with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, you come down. And then after he came down, Jesus went to his house. They're sitting there. They're talking. They had, he had the goat killed. He had, to, he had his servants fix a meal. And it took some time, some preparation for that to happen, right? And while they're talking to each other, we don't know what Jesus said. We don't know the conversation that happened, but we do know this, that at one point in the conversation, Zacchaeus gets up and he says, anybody I've ever stolen anything from, I'm going to give it back to them and I'm going to give it back with interest. And Jesus heard that and Jesus said, for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. That's his mission. That's the church's mission. That's, that's your mission to seek and to save the lost. 
what Zacchaeus is on your heart. Every one of us should have a Zacchaeus that's on our heart, somebody that we're praying for, whether it be a neighbor, our friend, or a coworker, somebody. The mission that Jesus had is our mission to seek and to save the lost. We should live like Jesus. Lost people are valued and they're loved, and the Lord knows their name. And we need to, we need to have a whatever it takes attitude, not compromising, not condescending, but saying, listen, we've come to be friends with those who don't know the Lord. I want you to look at verse 19, and let's go back to Paul. Paul says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. In order to break down barriers and build bridges for people who need to know the Lord Jesus Christ, here's the principle that Paul is teaching here. What is your relationship to people that are around you that don't know the Lord? Serve them. Just serve them. Just love them. The people at your workplace, people in your neighborhood, what is your role in their life? Don't be condescending to them. Don't look down upon them. Don't, don't look at their lifestyle and, and get insulted by it or offended by it. Why in the world, for us who know the Lord, why do we get offended by the choices that somebody makes that doesn't know the Lord? Why should that surprise us? If somebody doesn't know the Lord, why does it surprise that they live their life like they don't know the Lord? So we can't be condescending to them. we got to overlook the, the crazy mistakes they make, sometimes the offensive things they say, sometimes the positions they, they might have, and we become rather a servant to them. And that's what Paul's saying here. I have made myself a servant. The Greek verb here literally means to enslave. It's a bond servant. So Paul, in effect, is saying, I have placed myself under bondage to every person who does not know Jesus Christ, that I might win as many people to Christ as I possibly can. And the greatest gospel message that you can ever present to anybody is love them and serve them and do good to them and be kind to them. This principle of voluntary slavery is described in the Old Testament. You know, slavery, unfortunately, it's a reality. It's in the world right now. We think we live in a world that doesn't have slaves. Wrong. There are millions of people that are enslaved right now around this world. In this time when Paul was writing this, there was two forms of slavery. There was a forced slavery. The Roman Empire would conquer cultures and imprison people and force them into slavery. But there was also a voluntary servitude that sometimes people would voluntarily become a servant of a household. The Israelites, in their culture, they were permitted to keep fellow Jews as servants, but only for six years. After six years, they had to be freed. But if a Jewish man voluntarily chose to continue to be a servant in a household because he's being taken care of, he loves the people he's serving, what would happen is they would take an awl and they would pierce his ear. And the hole in the ear was assigned to everybody else that I'm a servant in this household by choice. I'm not forced to do this. I am making a choice. This is a sign that I am choosing to serve this family. And this is what Paul is saying. Think about this passage. He is saying, whatever it takes, I put myself in servitude to other people that I might win just one soul for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we should do. When people see us in our workplace or our family or whatever place, they'll say, oh, wow, Tim, oh, John, oh, Lisa, man, she is so awesome. Anything you need help with, they're right there to help. They go the extra mile. They're so kind. They're so nice. I've been telling you about these great stories of the past, how God has moved in amazing ways. I want to finish today by talking about a man by the name of David Livingston. Have you heard of David Livingston? He was absolutely brilliant. When he was 20, he went to school and studied Greek theology. He went to the Glasgow University and graduated with a degree in medicine. He was absolutely brilliant. He could have done anything that he wanted to do, but he surrendered his life to the Lord God Almighty and to Jesus Christ and went to the mission field. And of all places, God sent him to Africa. And at that time, 
There was no white man that had entered into the interior of Africa. There were missionaries on the coast. And one of these missionaries that lived on the coast, his name was Robert Moffat. He came one day to give seminars about Africa and explain about Africa. And he made a comment when David Livingston was in the audience that changed David Livingston's life and changed the continent of Africa itself. He said, often as I have looked to the vast plains of the north from the southern tip of Africa, I have seen the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary has ever been. And Livingston said to himself, a thousand villages, no missionary, no gospel, no Christ, no salvation, no life, no light, nothing but sin and death and darkness. God, I will go to Africa. So as a pioneer minister in Africa, Livingston walked not through a jungle of wild beasts and poisonous snakes and thick bushes, but he walked through personal jungles in his own heart, heart ache and hurt and personal sacrifice. One day a huge lion leaped on him and clamped his teeth on his shoulder and crushed it, and he was never able to use his arm again. They took him back to the coast to nurse him to health, and there he met a young, uh, a young um, lady named Mary, and they fell in love, and they got married. They had five children, and while crossing one of the vast plains of Africa, one of their children died. They immediately concluded it was not safe for the family to be there, so they went back to England. And for five years, Livingston stayed in Africa and did not see the face of his wife and children. Finally, he went home for a much-needed rest, and he burst into his old home in Scotland only to find it empty because his family had just buried his father while he was away. He enjoyed time with his family, but then it was time for him to go back to Africa. And so for years and years, again, he didn't see his wife and his children. And finally, he received a letter from his wife that the children were old and they were okay and that she could come to Africa and she could finally serve with him and be with him. So for months, she traveled across oceans and upstreams and rivers until finally they were together again. But the trip was so difficult that she was struck by an African fever. And David Livingston devoted every ounce of his medical skill to try to cure her. But she fell and she died. And when she died, he wrote this in his journal. My Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I again dedicate my whole self to thee. I shall place no value on anything I possess or on anything I may do except in relationship to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So he continued his, his missionary journey in the jungles, and they stole his medicine. The people who were ministering to stole his medicine and he said to the Lord in prayer, God, you know I will die without the medicine. Livingston had not seen a white man in five years, but now he is, here is in the middle of Africa on his knees crying out to the Lord. And as he lifted up his eyes, he saw a man coming and the famous words were uttered, right? Dr. Livingston, I presume. It was Henry Stanley. He was a reporter that worked for the New York Herald. And Stanley had been sent by the newspaper to try to find this legendary missionary. The reporter was an atheist and bragged about it. But as he began to live with David Livingston, within four months, he gave his heart and his life to the Lord Jesus Christ and was gloriously saved. He left and he begged Livingston to come with him, but Livingston refused. He kept plunging deeper in Africa, deeper in Africa, deeper in Africa. He could eat nothing but maize, that's corn, his teeth fell out. He got boils on his body, lacerations on his feet. He got to the point he couldn't even walk. They carried him around on a stretcher. They'd prop him up on a tree, and he would preach the gospel to village after village after village. But finally, he became so sick that he died. He died alone. They thought he was asleep on his cot. He was leaned over in a kneeling position. They thought he was praying or asleep, but he was gone. Now, I want you to think about this. 25 years after the death of David Livingston, there were 10 million Christians in Africa. The gospel spread through the continent of Africa 
in the last century faster than it had ever spread in the history of Christianity going all the way back to the cross. What has happened in Africa is absolutely amazing. Hundreds of millions, three, over 300 million Christians in Africa right now. Why? In part because one man said, whatever it takes, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll pay any price. I will count any cost that I might win some to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that that will be our passion. I pray that we'll have revival. I pray that we'll have awakening. I pray that the Lord will use us. That as we drive up and down these streets and as we get ready to go out and saturate our communities with the gospel, that on our hearts we'll have that whatever it takes attitude. Lord, use us to win some for you. Amen? Amen. Let's have our worship team come. Let's stand together as we pray and get ready to sing and worship. I don't want to presume that every person in here has a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, you confess with your mouth, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. The Bible says you will be saved. So let's just bow our heads for prayer for just a moment. And I just want to ask you, if, if you know that you need to pray and receive Jesus in your heart, would you raise your hand? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to ask you to do anything besides just pray where you're at. Amen. 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 Right where you're at, the Bible just says, you believe in your heart and you just say with your mouth, Lord, you are the Lord. And I want you to come into my life and I want to follow you. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So right where you're at, just pray, Lord, please come into my life. I want to follow you. For the rest of you who are followers of Jesus, would you just not, uh, would you just, would you just pray this prayer as we get ready to worship here? Lord, give me a renewed passion for, for souls. Everybody around me has a soul and they're going to be somewhere for eternity. Lord, would you just please Give me a renewed passion for other people. I don't, witnessing is scary. We got to break down some barriers. One of them is fear. But Lord, just give me some boldness. Help me be able to share what's so important to me, you, Lord Jesus. Help me to be able to share you with other people around me, Lord. Give me the natural ability to do it. Help me to speak as I ought to speak, Lord. Lord, I pray for this church. I pray for revival. I pray for awakening, Lord God. I pray that you will use us as your people, to bring light, to push back darkness. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jill and I are here to pray with you. We will practice some social distancing. If there's something on your heart that you'd like to come and let us pray for, we would like to pray for you. If you have received Jesus as your Savior today and you want to just give Jesus glory for it, we invite you to come and let Jill and I just pray a blessing for you as you have made this momentous decision in your life. Uh, but you worship, you sing, you do as the Lord leads you. Let's, let's, let's sing.
together and just give him thanks today. Everybody wave at everybody. Everybody wave at everybody. You guys by the camera, look right into it. Wave at everybody on our online campus and Pastor Alex in Indonesia. I know he's watching us. I'll be in my car on the way to Baldwin. He'll send me a picture of me preaching. So I should send a, him a picture of Ahmad back there filming me. So, but anyway, Alex in Indonesia, God bless you, brother. We love you. We love, we love, we love Indonesia. Every time he texts me, he says, Indonesia loves you, Pastor. Well, America loves you, Pastor Alex, right? Everybody say that. Yeah. All right. Amen. All right. God bless you. Whatever it takes, serve, serve, serve this week. God bless you. And I search the world. But it couldn't fill me And the man's empty praise And the treasures that fail Are never enough Then you came along Let put me back together And every desire is now satisfied
Yeah. 